And the Srimad Bhagavatam explains that he picked up a stick and totally ignoring Krishna Balaram, he ordered the gopis to go with him. Very harshly, abrasively, that you are all for me and me alone. And he started, come, go this direction. And they, they, they were screaming out, Rama, Krishna, Rama, Krishna. He was out from here. He was chasing them to the north. This is the quality that we are vulnerable to. When a person has great wealth, great influence, we become prone to thinking, I am the controller, I am the enjoyer. And in this case, Srila Prabhupada and our Acharyas explain, when you really get in this enjoying mentality, you think that everything is for my enjoyment. And the gopis were the most beautiful ladies in all of creation. And he could not tolerate thinking anybody else except me could enjoy such beautiful ladies. It was his entitlement You are mine. You come with me. And he was forcing the gopis in the northern direction. And the gopis were crying out, Ram, Krishna, Ram, Krishna. And Krishna and Balaramji, they said, we will come, we will protect you. And they both picked up big logs and went to chase after Shankachuda. Meanwhile, as he was already taking the gopis into the forest like, like a malicious thief will steal small little helpless calves. That's how he was taking them away. Krishna Balaram came charging toward him. And when he saw them, he realized, I have to get out of here. So he ran away. Krishna entrusted the gopis to Lord Balaram and he went to chase after Shankachuda. Meanwhile, Balaramji was pacifying the gopis and they were singing Krishna's glories. And Krishna chased after. It says they went a distance, but it didn't seem like a distance. And Krishna caught him and with his fist now, any part of Krishna's body can do any other part, because Krishna is inconceivable and infinite. With his fist, he just punched Shankachuda on the head, and his head came off. <laughs> Sri Krishna Bhagavan Kija. He was liberated. <laughs> then Krishna took that jewel and brought it back. And in front of all the Braja Gopis, he presented the jewel to Sri Balaramji, his elder brother. A little later, when Krishna and Radharani were in Shamkutir, enjoying their beautiful, loving pastimes there, and then some time passed, Balaram gave the jewel to Madhu Mangal to present it to Srimati Radharani. Because even Balaram knew there is no greater way to serve and please Krishna than to give the highest satisfaction to Radharani. So that became Radharani's jewel, which she made a necklace and wore it around her neck, according to our acharyas. And it's a long story we will not get into today, but later on in the Srimad Bhagavatam, that same jewel of Shankachuda that was presented to Balaram and then to Sri Radharani became the Shamantaka jewel, which was a very beautiful story. 
Shankachuda represents proneness to name and fame and the desire for sense gratification under the plea of devotion. This could be a devastating demon within our hearts. To desire our own personal sense gratification, to try to manipulate situations in the name of Krishna's service for our own sense gratification. That tendency is very much within any neophyte devotee and even advanced devotees. It's there until we're extremely elevated and purified. The proneness to want to manipulate, facilitate our own sense gratification in the plea of devotional service. And that proneness toward name and fame. People in this world think that getting prestige, fame, or wealth, property, money, that it will give them strength. But real strength is a Goswami. A Goswami is one who doesn't need any of those things. A person who is actually Atmarama, self-satisfied. If we understand the principle of Rupa Goswami, Yukta Vairagya, properly, then we can have all these things, but we use them as instruments of Krishna's service, always remembering nothing is mine. I'm just a custodian of Krishna's property, and my only moral right is to use it for Krishna's service. Whether it's my intelligence, my ability, my wealth, or my influence, But if we don't have that consciousness, what usually happens is the more wealth we have, the more name and fame we have, the weaker we become spiritually. Because like Shankachuda, we think I am the enjoyer. And like Shankachuda, we become envious of someone who is enjoying what we think we should be enjoying or who we think we should be controlling. For one who is addicted to the idea of being a controller, to be frustrated in our attempts is extremely painful. Even good advice, it's hard to take. We act in ways that are so terribly destructive to ourselves, to our loved ones, to the world. Therefore, Krishna explains, from the very beginning we have to curb these tendencies before it comes to that point. Shankachuda. But like the gopis, when our devotion starts getting dragged away by these demons within us for wealth, name and fame, the proneness to enjoy in the name of devotional service our own selfish desires, when we find these things happening like the gopis, what did they do? They helplessly, from their hearts, understood that the only way that we can be protected from this violation, from this corruption, is to loudly cry out the holy name. <laughs> and 
and then Krishna will come because he's not different than his name. He may come in different ways too. He may come through good guidance of another Vaishnava. He may come th through realization and revelation. But ultimately, Krishna, he kill, by his grace, he kills these demons within our hearts. And then he presents the crest jewel, the Purushartha Siromani. Lord Chaitanya said, Prema Bhakti, unmotivated, uninterrupted, ecstatic love for Krishna is the crown jewel of all realizations, the ultimate aspiration of every heart. And that is given by Sri Radharani and Krishna. When we sharanagati, when we take shelter, through the holy names, through the Srimad Bhagavatam, through the Vaishnavas, and through our Seva. A little down is Gwalpokara, where Krishna and Balaram and Gopas would take prasad. And from there, Krishna would slip away to Sri Radha Kund to meet with Sri Radha and gopis. There's a nice story that Madhu Mangal, a Brahmin cowherd boy, who very much was a liking eating prasad, especially laddu. He would go with Krishna to Surya Kund, where he would be like a priest and perform different pujas where Sri Radharani was worshipping Surya Dev, and he would get Dakshina of Ladus. So he came back with Krishna to Gwalpokar and he had all these Ladus wrapped up in a little sack, a little cloth. He wore it on his dhoti, and Balaram was there, and Gopas, and they one of them stole the bag of Ladus, grabbed it from him. And he tried to get it back, and before he could even reach that person, he gave the ladus to all the other boys, and the boys were eating it, and he was very upset. He said, this is the property of a Brahmin. You have stolen the property of a Brahmin. I have the power to curse you for this. And they all laughed so hard as they were eating his ladus. And while they were laughing, one of them came from behind him and pulled the back of his dhoti out, and another person put their hands around his eyes, and another person uh, pulled his sika out, and, and he was, it was a very embarrassing situation. So what could he do? Whatever curses, whatever threats, they just laughed and laughed and laughed, and as a cowherd boy, he said, I'm going to tell your mothers what you did to a Brahmin. And on his way, Krishna met him and said, no, no, they're just joking, they're just laughing, here's some ladus and we'll dress you again. And then they all played together in Gwalpokar. And from there we come back to Manasi Ganga where we began our Parikrama. I'd like to read, I'm, I'll end my little talk tonight and then we're going to ask some of our special guests to all come on stage and give blessings and words of wisdom to all of you. This is a letter that I recently received. <clears throat> When I was, before I settled in India, in the early 1980s, through the mid 80s, I was traveling and going to colleges and universities in America, 
We started several centers in these areas. And at that time in Cincinnati on Macmillan Street, which was the main road of the college, the University of Cincinnati with 40,000 students. We were right across the street from the college. Do you want to hear this story? And our next door neighbor on one side was an all night rock and roll bar. And they had massive amplifiers with music. And on the other side of us was a pizza restaurant, which wasn't so loud, but it was <laughs> sometimes it distracted devotees. <laughs> So, <clears throat> I remember on the weekends trying to sleep in our little center. We had a temple room and some little ashrams. The music was so loud, and it wasn't classical Vedic ragas either. It was so loud. It was like this was my realization. It was like trying to go to sleep in the middle of two stereo earphones packed together on full volume. That's how loud it was. But somehow or other, we learned to just chant Hare Krishna and go to sleep. Because that, you, you can, uh, you, un, when there's necessity, it's amazing how human beings could ad adapt and adjust. There was one little girl whose family was becoming devotees. Her name was Sonia. And one of my dear god sisters, Ladini Devi, she was traveling to all the different centers that we started, and she was taking care like a mother of all the people we were cultivating. And this little girl, Sonia, she was probably about four years old or something like that. She followed Ladini around everywhere. She just was completely attached. But what I found is Ladini Devi Prabhu, she had such a spontaneous, natural enthusiasm to serve. She just was infused and was like a fountain of love for Krishna that anybody she came in contact with just never wanted to leave her. It's incredible. In Columbus, we would do Harinam Sankirtan, and she would make popcorn. Do you know what popcorn is? And she'd pack it in little bags with her own hands, and while we'd be singing, she'd just be smiling and giving out popcorn while she was dancing in the streets of America. She'd be dancing ecstatically, giving popcorn to everybody. And people would just follow her wherever she was. Unbelievable. So this little Sonia, she was very deeply affected by Ladini. Actually, I first met her when she was three. I just verified this. When she was three years old, that's when she first started coming. And a little later, Ladini Devi became very, very um, wonderful in Prabhupada's service in Africa under the auspicious guidance of His Holiness Srila Bhakti Tirtha Swami Maharaj. And last year at our drama festival, there was a whole drama about her life. So this letter I'm about to read is from Sonia, who later on became initiated. She was given the name Radha Sundari Devi. And Time has its ways of evolving people's lives in different ways. And that little three-year-old Sonia 
Now she's Radha Sundari, and she got married. She had a son named Braj Mohan, who is now three years old. <laughs> and, you know, little me, I'm kind of just watching. You know, she was three, and now he's three. And I, where am I going? <laughs> I'm about the same size. I'm getting a little smaller, I think, actually. But her son, her three-year-old son's name is Braj Mohan. And he was, his father is Ananda Tirtha Prabhu, whose mother is a dear disciple of Srila Prabhupada. They were both born, or very early age, they came to the path of bhakti. I'd like to share this with you because it says something about what we could learn from even tiny little children. When I read this, it really affected my heart. Are you ready? Thank you. This came this year, just after Radhastami. Radha Sundari writes, For the last few days, we have been reading Radharani's pastimes in preparation for Radhastami. One night at bedtime, we read the pastime <clears throat> of Krishna waiting in agony at Kokilavan for Radharani to come. When she did not come, he sent Subal to exchange places with her and sent her in guy, sent her in his guise. After we read the story and turned off the light, I heard my three-year-old son, Braj Mohan, breathing deeply and then sniffling. I thought he was congested. Radha Sundari, in her motherly affection, continues the letter. Then he suddenly burst into piteous crying. In a choked voice, he told me that it was too sad for Krishna to be separated from Radharani. I tried so hard to convince him that they are never separate from each other. And finally, he calmed down, only to start crying again after a few minutes, because it was too painful to think of Krishna separated from Srimati Radharani. As I tried to console him, I started thinking about the heartache Krishna experienced in Radharani's absence, and I also started to cry. It was amazing to share that beautiful devotional sentiment with little Braj Mohan. I was just reading the pastimes with my eyes, but he helped me to actually enter them with my heart. What a blessing. Thank you very much. <clears throat>